Surgeon General starts this whole conversation by saying far too many young people are struggling with their mental health and unable to get the support they need. Now, we all have a role to play in supporting youth mental health and creating a world where young people thrive. And this is why it's so important to share this message with you, audience, because you're all involved in this space, especially with Latino youth and um, just youth and mental health in general, um, just by virtue of being parents, but community members, but also nonprofit leaders and community leaders. So going back to the Surgeon General's advisory, um, there were several key takeaways, very simple and kind of obvious, but maybe not. The first being that mental health is an essential part of overall health, punto. And yet I think in the Latino community, there's a lot of stigma still, but also a lack of understanding or even recognition that that's a thing, right? The other thing he raises is that COVID-19 added to a pre-existing conditions that already existed. And I think for those of us who have been involved in health equity work, that much was clear, but it also uh, provided some opportunities um, that I think are uh, need to be thought through. And the third that he raises is that mental health is shaped by a combination of factors, biological and environmental. And biological, obviously, your genes, you know, uh, your your hormones, etc. And and environmental, it's yes, it's environmental, but environmental is also the context in which you live. Um, so he highlighted something in his advisory that I thought was critical to raise here as well. He said, too often young people are bombarded with messages through the media and popular culture that erode their sense of self-worth. It's telling them they're not good looking enough, they're not popular enough, they're not smart enough or rich enough. But then he went on to add layers to this about how progress on legitimate and very distressing issues like climate change income inequality, racial injustice, the opioid epidemic, gun violence, how all of this progress is very, very slow in coming. And it's really, these are my words now, I think it's created or creating a sense of creeping desperation in our young people, because I think they don't really know what they can do or whether whatever they do even matters or has an impact. But I think what's been missing from that discussion is the added impact of language, intergenerational trauma, and feeling those feelings of outsider when you're an immigrant. The report speaking the language, I think, highlights how children and adolescents and immigrant families are experiencing a mental health crisis, given these factors that is reflected very much in higher rates of depression, anxiety, and self-harm. And they add put it on the table, just like the Surgeon General basically saying, solving this crisis depends on greater access to quality mental health care and support from all of us. And this is why we are having these wonderful speakers today um, to talk about their report, speaking the language. So I will turn to you. Good morning again. Um, uh, maybe you could, um, I would like it if you'd start with an introduction. I will start with you, Sarah. Tell us briefly about yourself, your role at Centro Sol, and um, why you got involved in this work. What compelled you to do this? Um, you know, take three, four, five minutes. Um, thanks very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Sarah Polk. I'm a pediatrician. Um, I am work at Hopkins. I'm the medical director of a primary care pediatric practice located at Bayview and um, am one of the founders of Central Soul, um, which was that was really inspired by my work trying to provide equitable care to Latino children and immigrant families um, who comprise the majority of the patients uh, at that practice. Um, and the report comes out of some troubling observations um, as clinicians, and um, thanks to some mentorship from um, Josh Sharstein, formerly of the State Department of, of uh, Health, among other positions, um, Josh connected uh, me and the Central Soul Policy Group to Ashley Black of the Public Justice Center to sort of bring light um, and some context and some policy recommendations to these uh, cases that we've seen. Um, so I'll really quickly um, provide the, the case examples that, that led to this report. So the first is um, an instance of uh, no interpretation, no care. So uh, we had a, one of my colleagues had a 16-year-old patient, um, was um, suffering from anorexia, um, 
was the pediatrician recognized this and referred her to uh, a mental health provider um, specializing in eating disorders. And um, the therapist, um, the patient initially got in with a, a, a therapist specializing in sort of general um, child mental health. And the therapist said, no, 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 this child needs actually subspecialty psychiatric care. And that subspecialty psychiatric care was refused because no um, Spanish speaking um, provider was available. And so the patient was refused gold standard care for this particular illness. Um, the second case was no interpretation for the parent resulting in no care for the child. Um, so again, a patient presented to pediatric um, primary care, wasn't sleeping well, had, had poor appetite and um, Following a longer conversation about symptoms and doing some screeners, it was recognized that the child was um, suffering from depression. Um, the mom was on board that this was a problem that needed attention and mom was given instructions for how to make an appointment with a, an outside um, mental health provider. And um, the, the child presented again to pediatric primary care about six weeks later. And we said, well, you know, what happened when you made an appointment? And they said, well, um, they wouldn't make an appointment for me because I called and I speak Spanish and they, they wouldn't speak to me in Spanish and they wouldn't let me use an interpreter to make an appointment. Um, so the child's first and best language is English, but because the, because the parent did not speak English, um, the agency would not, would not assist mom in even just making the appointment. And the third case was, um, again, sort of no interpretation, no care for students. So some, um, uh, it was recognized some kids present with mental health um, challenges in schools and um, and and there are luckily um, school-based therapists available. Um, you know, the majority of those school-based therapists, you know, speak English and don't speak other languages. And it was recognized that in some schools in our area, um, the young people who were recognized as needing school-based mental health care, if they needed that care not to be provided in English, they were put on a wait list. So they were not triaged according to their need. They were not provided with a therapist who provided care via an interpreter. They were put on really a wait list to nowhere for a Spanish-speaking therapist who may or may not exist at some point in the future. So the, um, so these three cases um, were sort of in violation of regulations and um, and with you know short term and long term um, significant implications for the child's well being. So um, this led us to sort of investigate the matter further and make some um, policy suggestions around how to make our um, mental health care system more equitable. You're muted, Gabriela. Sorry, um, I was just saying that's a lot of information um, and really specific cases that um, I think, um, well, you know, they're the kind of thing, they seem like they're easy to resolve, but at the same time, the impacts are so, so deep. Um, what happened to the young woman with anorexia, right? Did she, by not getting the care she needed, did she get worse? Um, did she, you know, she's even still among us. I hate to ask like that. Um, because that really puts her at risk. Um, so I would like to, is, um, has Ashley joined us yet? I don't see her, does anybody? Okay, well, um, I don't see Ashley uh, yet. Um, so uh, let's let's keep talking, Sara. Um, I think, um, what would you say from the report are among the most important highlights that we should pay attention to? I mean, you have an opportunity here. We, we're we all uh, in the nonprofit space and in the, um, you know, we can do some advocacy. We do all different kinds of things. Um, and the report covers a lot of ground on the legal sides. I mean, one of the things that really struck me was how, um, oh, thank you for downloading that, uh, Monica, in the chat. Um, there's a link to the report in the chat. Um, I think one of the, the things that really strikes me is, um, is that there's a lot of attention that needs to be raised, um, but there's also um, a lot of gaps that need to be filled. Um, what would you say are the highlights from the report that, that you want us to take as our key takeaways? Yeah, I think we really structured it around um, some recommendations, 
five recommendations at the end of the report. Um, but I think earlier I'll I'll um I'll speak on behalf of the lawyer <laughs> to make sure that that all of you are aware of of sort of what the requirements are for providing care and what you know what patient rights people have. Um, so I'm just going to read this because it's you know so that it's clear and all mental health providers in Maryland who accept federal financial assistance for any of their programs or activities must provide interpretation and translation to all children and adolescents um, of immigrant families. So what this means is that anybody, any agency, any health system that cares for people who get Medicaid must provide interpretation and translation. Mm -hmm. So that really covers the landscape for low income, um, for low income persons. And it doesn't matter whether the money walks in the door for program A and you're referring a, a child to program B. It's the, the whole the whole system is obligated to provide interpretation and translation because they are accepting federal money to provide care. So it's that's a little bit like period, end of story. So mm -hmm. everybody's antenna can be up for any refusal. They said they couldn't take care of me because I don't speak English. They said they couldn't take care of me because my child doesn't speak English. There are very few instances in which that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, this is obviously distinct from challenges that arrive due, due to a lack of um, insurance. Mm -hmm. So that is that is a whole nother ball of wax. But when we talk about kids, if we think about you know low income Latino children in the state of Maryland, about 95% of them are US citizens and are Medicaid eligible. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. I was gonna, I was just gonna follow up on that. Um, so um, what kind of information should we be sharing with our community members um, when we're at, you know, if we're a Latino serving organization or, because uh, I think part of the challenge is we don't often hear about it because these are, these are personal moments, right? This is an individual who goes seeking help. Um, and there, there's that moment of stress where you don't know what to say to your doctor. And um, like, what is like the easiest message they should carry with them that we do know we can get access to help and that we should do this, um, how would how how can we help to um, get that message out there? Well, I think probably at the broadest is the more we talk about, the more we're willing to talk about mental health in all of the work that we do, and the more that we invite discussions about mental health and mental well-being, the more things like this must may come out. Um, and I think also to invite to inquire about um about um why people are not getting help for for problems that they present to you now again mm -hmm. if you primarily serve adults i acknowledge the huge barriers related to insurance but i think inquiring um you know in and, and you everyone will have to decide the appropriateness of that in every conversation but i think you know establishing yourself as an ally and and inquiring gently if it seems appropriate. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third step to that is, is really encouraging people, um, it's, the complaint is not the right word, but in, com, you know, encouraging people um, to speak to out. demand- To speak out. In their <laughs> rights, yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, and sort of encouraging that as an active public service that all of us can do on behalf of our entire community. Um, and, you know, there might be instances in which some of you could write a letter of complaint or inquiry, you know, in partnership with that person. Um, in the past, uh, you know, when staffing allows, we would we sometimes have, we help parents write letters in Spanish that then we translate and submit the, you know, both copies because it feels appropriate for the, the parent to sign the Spanish language one. Mm -hmm. So I just think um, it's a very, um, you know, it's a very American, um, it's maybe it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a culturation that like you have a right to right. complain and you should. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and then if your patient doesn't, doesn't feel comfortable with that, you can speak out on your own. You can anonymize the case. 
but you have, we have a lot of power, um, Mm -hmm. you know, in relative terms. Right. Um, And um, yeah. So I just think to speak up on behalf of clients and say like, you know, it sounds like this didn't, you know, I had a patient anonymize them. They were told they couldn't have an appointment because of this, you know, is that the case? Um, Because I will say that there are, and then I'll stop, but there's sort of sins of omission and sins of commission. So there are uh, people yeah. that are really unaware of these mm-hmm. regulations. I mm-hmm. find that incredibly discouraging, <laughs> but there are people, there are agencies that are, that are really, that are really unaware. Um, and there are a lot of, of, of good people trying that, you know, want to provide equitable care and they are working within systems that don't support language services. So, they would love to call an interpreter, but they don't know how within their, you know, their, their agency does not have a language policy. They don't know mm-hmm. the call. So they need, we are also help. That's an ally that we can help if we send a letter, an email or a whatever, you know, to someone in leadership in their agency. Um, so. so as I'm listening to you speak, I'm, I'm hearing a couple of things. Um, one, this is an emerging community um, that oftentimes arrives in a new space and is uh, acculturating, to your point, um, about how the system works. So they need education as, as a community about how the system works. Um, the other part is the system itself and education. And maybe this is something as nonprofits that we could provide and as community leaders, education around um, in very specific issues related to language access, which, which you know, are narrow, uh, but also it's a federal rule and uh, it's a requirement. And so um, how can we help them? Uh, what opportunities do we have to, como se dice, incidir, to, I guess, advocate within, yeah. um, within the agencies uh, yeah. on, uh, in a general sense? But you also said something at the very beginning when you started to speak about just mental health generally. Mm -hmm. Um, And and maybe we could talk a little bit about that. You know, the Surgeon General's report, um, you know, it's very top line. um, And and it it talks about, you know, we need to get access to mental health, just like what you're saying. Um, But he also talks about impacts of things around people. What, and that that, that there's change, we're seeing change within communities. Um, In your report, I think you even say like like increases in self-harm and those kinds of, issues. Um, could you talk to us a little bit more be, uh, beyond the specific cases, just trends that you're seeing in the community post-COVID um, that were are, that are aggravated by COVID? Yes. Um, uh, so the statistics around youth mental health are, are really pretty sobering. Um, um, there may be a part of it that's good news that we are the pediatricians are getting better about talking about this, that there is a little bit less stigma. So the issues are out in the open. Um, but there's also reason to be worried that they're just more kids who are really suffering, um, specifically from depression and anxiety. And there are worrisome trends um, regarding youth suicide. Um, there's always been a particular concern that the rates among Latina girls um, um, of suicidality are very high. Um, so it's just overall that the that the rates are really impressively high and we don't have the resources we need to provide um, individual care, um, which is often indicated for these kids. Um, it's not fully understood. Um, it does feel like an evil hangover of the COVID pandemic that, um, you know, essentially two years separated from peers without sort of passing through some normal developmental stages, um, that that was really harmful um, to kids. And then also that we live in, you know, I, I assume we've, everybody's always said they live in difficult times, but when we when we think about sort of the, the news cycles that kids are exposed to um, and sort of the existential threats that feel like come up in our news feeds every day, um, that impact is not trivial. And then finally, um, social media about which there are lots of um, concerns and um, you know we've never I mean this is one of the first generations to go through their whole developmental trajectory with so much exposure to social media Um, and while in some ways exposure to information can be can be very helpful there there are some there's some positive news about that 
you know, there's also the concern about cyberbullying and um, social isolation um, and the the promulgation of of sort of dangerous and harmful messages that kids can get mm -hmm. exposed to over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think that um, uh, that is. Um... Yeah, the media piece is really one that I think we're all trying to figure out how to address because it's it, it impacts all of us in so many different ways in our society in different ways, um, as as we've noted. Um, and I think for the on the mental health side, um, especially for young Latinas, um, there really is a pressure to, you know, fit in the norm of what a beauty in the U.S. is, and um, and it's um, we're different um, and. Um, you know, I'm personally, I'm biased. I think we're all beautiful, but hey, <laughs> um, I, uh, I also You're correct. Know You're correct. That. There is a right answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I also know that it's really awkward when you're the, you know, the little kid. I, when I think of my personal experience, when I first come to the U.S. and I get thrown in high school and I visualize this trauma, guys, um, you're a freshman in high school, but you've come out of the eighth grade and they've put you in second semester. Uh, of freshman year, uh, so and you don't know anybody, and your you know your English is fine, but uh, you just you're it's outer space, um, and and trying to understand American youth culture is very challenging. Uh, but there's also elements of other issues that are going on, having to do with bullying and heightened political tensions, as you were saying, like things they see on television from the news, um, that I think um, impact them. Being, they're being called names in the media, right? You know, uh, you know, what is it? Especially if they're young immigrant uh, or second, first generation uh, from first generation immigrant families, um, and I think that that also can impact very negatively and heavily in our in our in our young girls, leading to things like anorexia, not eating, um, et cetera. Um, I want to also, I want to, Peter, you mentioned something in the chat that I think it would be good to highlight. Could you talk a little bit about self advocacy? Um, because I know that's something you're you're pretty expert in. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was just going to say that, um, I mean, self-advocacy is important and, and certainly is, uh, as uh, Dr. Cole pointed out, um, if the person is, you know, maybe doesn't have the bandwidth to do the all of the advocacy for themselves, you know, they may be working three jobs and, you know, language is, is uh, certainly a barrier and all that. So you, you can help people with that. Um, but I think it, it really is important for people to get the sense that, they have the power, or at least they have some power to uh, change these systems and that they they should feel like they have the right to say, this isn't, you're, you're not treating me the way I should be treated and to speak up about it and to find allies who are, who are willing to help with that. Um, and I also would like to invite our, our um, uh, thank you, Peter, because I think that's, mm -hmm. um, that's very accurate. Um, but I also would not um, raise up um, that um, we should have others uh, put their comments in the chat because I think um, the more we discuss uh, to the earliest point of discussing mental health, this is a great opportunity for all of us to to learn more and how we can um, create change in our own lives, but also in the, the those of the people around us uh, through self advocacy. To Peter's point, um, and also um, just to get more information around around the um, the issues. Um, I see we're we're uh, talking contacts and networking. Uh, that's awesome. Um, does anybody have any questions to add? Because um, we can keep we can keep no, going. No, I, I, I Go have ahead, a Veronica. question. I have a question. Saludo, Dr. Paul. Good to see you again. Um, one of the challenges that we keep seeing over and over, and you and you scratch the surface on that, is is our girls. Um, I know that the data is woefully behind, but every little bit of reporting that we get indicates that our, our, our middle school, high school girls are really at risk because we're bicultural and often mm -hmm. because the eldest daughter tends to be the, 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 the caretaker. caregiver. Mom and dad are working two, three jobs. If they are two parents, you know, if it's a single family household, even more pressure on that child. But um, you're struggling with a bicultural piece of, you know, you're too American at home and you're too Latina at school and, you know, obviously social media. Um, so can we talk a little bit about what can be done? Um, I know we're talking advocacy. I know we're talking about get therapy, but it's not always accessible. 
So as a community, as people here, um, any advice, you know, do you recommend online therapy? Do you recommend oh, books, meditation? Question. Like, what can we do? Because, you know, I have my own daughter and I see a lot of community members where they're leaning on the church. The church isn't always equipped. So any insight on that? And then I have another comment when you're, when you're, when you talk about this piece, please. Um, I, um, I'm sort of whatever people can access from the menu of resources I'm in favor of. So I think, you know, every case is a little bit different and then access is always hard. Um, I do think there are a lot of ways. So it, it a little bit depends on the specific question. So if it's mm. a, if it's a young, if it's a 12 to 16 year old, who's, who's, you know, either depressed or anxious, um, you know, families should be encouraged to lean on the pediatrician. Um, families should be encouraged that they can um, access um, therapy without any paperwork from a pediatrician through Medicaid. Um, I think they should be encouraged to, to talk about mental health in those mm -hmm. homes. Normalize um, it, yeah. So those are sort of one thing. On, this, on the side of, I think there's also a lot of opportunity for supporting families by supporting the parents. Um, and I... I see sometimes parental reactions to kids that are are sort of maybe less gentle than I than I would hope for, but I am, you know, and I am a white person. I am not an immigrant. I am not Latina, but I I feel for these parents because when I think of all the parenting resources to which I have access, and and I just know that, you know, they don't they don't have a parenting manual necessarily that's that um that suits their circumstances and they may have what i feel like i observe anecdotally is that it's more common for a family to a woman to have a reliable social network that remains in her country of origin so she can call those people and they will give her loving advice but it's not always that helpful because the context is so different here and so these kids are navigating two cultures and so are the parents and they, it's much more common for the parent to know how they do not want to parent, but they really struggle with how do I replace that? Like, what do I replace that with? And so I think a church is not probably, a, may not be a great place for individual mental health counseling, but it could be a great place for a parenting group. Um, like a moderated, you don't need a professional, you know, but just a moderated conversation or, you know, just a conversation among peers to share best, you know, what's working for you and what is really hard. So I think this is um, what you're sharing is something that all of us can take on a little bit. And maybe Gabriela, we can we can talk about what and how MLU can facilitate some of these resources. I know we have so much on our plate. But definitely that piece of, of normalizing it. I mean, I have to commend you because I'm a first generation Dominican, right? I was born in the DR, raised in the DR. Y nadie hablaba de salud mental. Ese es un loco. Ese es una loca. Déjala tranquila. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was never anything open about it. And um, I think the last couple of years, COVID, I think we've normalized it. And I often speak that I have my therapist and I, you know, talk and learn and, and have an outlet. And, and I've had multiple strong bicultural Latinas come to me whispering and going, you have a therapist? Are you okay? And I'm like, why are you whispering? And of course I'm okay. That's why I'm okay, <laughs> because I have an outlet. So even that, that whole, even educated, Americanized Latinos still have that hang up. So I think there's an opportunity for us to certainly um, figure out a way, whether it's, you know, connecting some dots, whether identifying some resources. Like I, I think, um, so we, we have a website we're working on um, for mental health resources. Uh, uh, well, not for mental health, for, for health equity issues. Um, it sh should have been up in November, but here we are. Oh, <laughs> um, but um, uh, there is a section on mental health, um, not specifically on youth. So maybe it would be okay for us to add your report to to the as a resource and put down Centro Sol as a, as a place. Um, I also awesome. saw in the chat that someone, uh, uh, well, I saw a couple of things in the chat too um, to, to talk about. Um, 
Maria Matiela talks about how oftentimes uh, many in our communities come from authoritarian places. So self-advocacy is not really at the height of our, our thought process uh, and maybe even dangerous for our own health and well-being. Uh, and then the other component um, that I found really fascinating and absolutely correct because I heard it reinforced was that um, what about indigenous speakers who are not Spanish dominant? We're seeing more and more indigenous peoples arrive, uh, especially from Central America and Mexico, uh, Southern Mexico, um, who don't even speak Spanish. And so they're having a lot of, you know, they, you know, they're, they're, they already, they live in their own like narrow space as is, their communities are fairly small and now they're disconnected from those communities and they're bombarded by everything else we're bombarded by. Uh, so um, how does this uh, fit with that as well? And is this something we're considering? Um, any thoughts on those issues? Anybody wanna um, pipe, pipe in? Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Eduardo. I'm a Spanish interpreter here at uh, Bayview. I, I, I put a comment on the indigenous yes, uh, I saw situation. That. Yeah. Uh, and it's on a daily basis. I, I've worked in the uh, Brazilian Amazon with indigenous people. And I think here at Bayview, I see more indigenous people on a daily basis than I've ever seen back there. Because, you know, oh. uh, they're just like, you know, within this uh, generic uh, label Latinos or uh, Hispanics and uh, there's so much more uh, specific uh, cultural and linguistic uh, differences there, right? And I think uh, many people uh, have been trying to raise awareness of that situation here uh, since I started working here. But many people are still not familiar with the situation uh, of indigenous speakers. Many people tend to think that, you know, uh, uh, an indigenous language is just some sort of dialect of Spanish, which uh, 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 kind That's of sets up the wrong expectations, right? Uh, so I think even if we have difficulties finding interpreters for those languages, I think it's still important to raise awareness at least so that people see that as a priority to have an in-person interpreter. I've noticed that makes a, a huge difference, even if you're still interpreting in Spanish. For a person who's not a native speaker of Spanish, if you have an in-person interpreter, that helps. Uh, based on my own personal experience, you know, and also people, you know, having interpreters that are also familiar with this cultural and linguistic diversity, diversity within this so-called uh, Latino community, which technically many of them are not, you know, Latino in the sense that they don't speak Spanish as their first language. They come from Latin America, but they don't mm -hmm. speak Spanish. So I think uh, if uh, more awareness is raised, um, and, and I don't want it to be like an excuse to give up <laughs> when you don't find a mom interpreter or a Kichwa interpreter, quite the opposite, you know, uh, go the extra step to find an in-person interpreter, especially someone who's used to work with the communities. That's going to make a big difference. I have many concrete examples in which that did make a difference. Thank you. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, you raised a whole bunch of things there. Um, uh, yeah, this idea, this is something we talk a lot about, which is cultural competency. And I think this is also part of the education process that we can help with, with agencies, um, encouraging them and encourage them to ensure that their staff are trained in cultural competency and that they understand what that means. Cause it's not just one culture, it's many. Um, even within our Spanish language speakers, um, and Veronica and I joke a lot about this, um, we all carry our flags, right? And Carlos Orbe, who's our, our public affairs and communications uh, specialist, um, he, he's, he's like, we should do something where we talk about each, each flag for each one of us. Um, and uh, as part of our, our regular acculturation messaging, right? Um, and I think that's wonderful. Um, I think in the case of the indigenous people, what Eduardo raises is, is is really true. I mean, in Mexico, I think there's over 70 indigenous languages that are spoken. Um, add to that the ones from Central America and South America. And now we've really, and never mind other parts of the world, now we've really got a situation. Um, and um, I didn't realize they were increasing so much. I mean, the fact that you saw more at Bayview than you did in the Amazonas is, is pretty pretty amazing. Um, Eduardo, if I may ask, what are the most common indigenous languages you're encountering? Uh, it's uh, Mixteco, different varieties of Mixteco. Uh, Mam is one of them. Uh, Sipacapense is another one. And of course, uh, many Equatorians are Quechua speakers as well. Sometimes we even get uh, Garifuna, which is a language spoken mm -hmm. by an Afro-Latino community on the mm -hmm. coast. Uh, 
yeah. uh, uh, Guatemala and Honduras, uh, Belize okay. and so forth. So we have a lot of cultural and linguistic diversity that's kind of uh, swept under the rug, under the label Latino. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, it's a delicate situation, of course. It's not, I know it's not easy to find and train interpreters for those languages, but at least uh, raising awareness, I think, uh, helps. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'll give an example. I was working with a patient over the phone uh, back in the day during the pandemic, and the mother had uh, misunderstood instructions on how to care for a burn wound. And it turned out she was uh, a speaker of uh, Ishil, uh, who didn't, uh, who could speak Spanish, but she required some extra steps in making sure that there was uh, understanding. And she was treating the wound uh, incorrectly because uh, the previous instructions that she was given in Spanish weren't clear enough. And I think that's an example, you know, uh, even though I was working over the phone, the fact that I have awareness, you know, uh, that uh, uh, she wasn't a native speaker of Spanish, I think that helped uh, put uh, the treatment back on the right path. And that's mm -hmm. just an example of several other situations. Uh, a difference, of course, between my experience as an anthropological linguist is that the native communities, the indigenous communities in Brazil and in the Amazon, they are tiny. So you won't find, you know, hundreds of thousands of speakers of any of those languages. So you don't uh, hear you, because the communities in, like you said, in Mexico and in Honduras, Guatemala and so forth, they are large communities of uh, uh, speakers that's of indigenous right. languages. They will end up coming to the US as well. So that's why, you know, I can say for sure that I've seen more speakers of indigenous languages here. I mean, on a daily basis than right. I've seen uh, in my experience as an anthropological linguist. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so we've uh, been joined by Ashley Black uh, from Public Justice Center. Um, and Ashley, you came in on the tail end of this discussion on language um, and, um, and you know, the indigenous component as well. Um, maybe tell us uh, a little bit about the, the rules of the road um, that we should all be considering when uh, addressing uh, language as a, as a barrier to access to care um, and um, in terms of our rights, because I have this theory that um, if we know what our rights are, that might lower some of our stress levels uh, because mm -hmm. we know we can speak out on our behalf and um, maybe that helps with our mental health. But okay, it's all yours, Ashley. Yes, thank you so much. And I just want to say I apologize for being so late this morning. I had an unexpected emergency with my child that delayed me from being able to join, but I'm happy I'm here now. Um, so happy to talk about, you know, what's required in terms of language access um, for individuals with limited English proficiency trying to access healthcare services. So there's, um, there are state and federal laws related to language access. When we're talking about um, language access more broadly, we would look at the federal law. So there is, um, it's Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and there's also Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. So the difference between those two, they're very similar. Um, Title VI is uh, it's an anti-discrimination law that prohibits discrimination um, against protected classes of persons. So what that means is basically um, it includes race, color, national origin, um, gender, many other things. And language access falls into the category of national origin, um, the spoken language of the person. So, what that does is any, um, any entity that receives federal funding is required to provide meaningful access to their services, um, their programs or activities to individuals with limited English proficiency, which means providing interpretation and translation. Um, Section 1557 is the healthcare counterpart of Title VI. So what that does, it's essentially the same. Anti-discrimination law um, protects you know, different classes of people, including national origin and language access. Mm -hmm. And um, what that does is it requires healthcare entities that receive federal funding to provide language services. So federal funding can be, um, it can be, you know, Medicaid, Medicare funding that providers receive. It can also be things like equipment that might be on loan from the federal government. Um, it it's very expansive in what it includes. So even if only one part of a provider's program receives even just a dollar of federal funding, they're required to comply with those laws for all of their programming and all of their activities and services. Um, so interpretation has to be free uh, for the individual. 
And it can also extend beyond the patient. It can actually extend to um, the parents of a child if the parents have limited English proficiency and they're um, coordinating that child's care. So language uh, interpretation translation would need to be provided to that parent. Um, and also, you know, there are very, very limited circumstances in which a provider can rely on um, interpretation provided by someone who's not necessarily qualified. So let's say a friend, um, family mm -hmm. member, or even a minor child, the circumstances are very limited because the um, intention of this law is that qualified interpretation and translation needs to be provided to the person. So only in emergencies um, and uh, can a provider utilize um, a, uh, a person's child or, or child to, to act as an interpreter. And only in um, you know, situations where the person um, says that they would prefer to have, say, an adult friend or family member interpret for them, can the provider rely on that interpretation, but it has to be that no one else is available to provide it. Um, and it's the same thing for a child, it has to be no one else can provide interpretation and there has to be an emergency. Um, and the last few things that I'll cover is just that, um, you know, like I said, this extends to translation as well. So any vital documents have to also be translated to that person's language. And this yeah. is a piece that I, I see uh, Gabrielle kind of nodding her head. <laughs> this is a piece that, um, at the Public Justice Center, we're a, um, a nonprofit uh, legal services organization. And I forgot to introduce myself. I lead our health and benefits equity project. I'm the lead attorney for our project. Um, so this is an area that we see a lot where providers and also um, state agencies sometimes miss. Um, you know, I've had situations, I can think of one in particular, we had a client who had cancer and um, wanted to return to her home country to receive care but needed her medical records and also wanted to understand her medical records. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, the provider told her, no, we don't translate records, which is actually in violation of the federal law. Um, those are considered vital communications, vital documents. So something that's vital, it is gonna depend on the importance of that information and the consequences that it could have for the person with limited English proficiency if that information isn't provided accurately. So when we're talking about medical records, for someone to be able to understand their condition and you know, continue to seek care, or even if it's just for their personal use to understand their treatment plan, um, then that is required. It also can include things like intake forms, consent forms, discharge instructions, all of those important things that providers are communicating to their patients that if they were, were misunderstood might result in harm, like a person you know, maybe not taking a medication that they're supposed to, um, to manage their health condition because they didn't, you know, because the instructions were given in English. Um, so that is, that's the sort of the, um, the short version of what's required. There is, um, there's some nuance in there. There's also, I always tell um, providers that um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, who is responsible for um, enforcing uh, the federal law, um, they have a lot of resources on, you know, what is required and um, Q and A's on understanding providers' obligations to provide language services, and then also um, they are actually in the process of um, revising Section 1557. So that's the Affordable Care Act part. Um, what's going on right now is it was open for public comment and uh, last fall, I believe because the federal government is looking at strengthening the language access protections. There were some things that were stripped from it um, under the previous federal administrations, under the Trump administration that the mm -hmm. Biden administration is trying to restore. And they're also looking at expanding what is considered federal financial assistance and um, thinking of including you know, parts of uh, Medicare. I think it's, it's either part D or B that has been uh, historically excluded from this. So it may be included in the future. So I encourage providers to try to stay up to date on that. So I, actually, um, I don't, I'm gonna, I'm probably asking the wrong question, um, but somewhere in recently, I saw language on um, money for ensuring there's translation available at our state agencies and that some of our state agencies, there's no requirements for that. Is that true? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I will say, you know, the federal laws, we also have a, 
state counterpart for language access that applies to our state agencies that receive federal funding. It's it's basically just um, codifying what the federal law already requires. So it's it's not something new. But I will say all of those mandates are unfunded, um, which we know and you know we cover in the report has been a challenge for providers that want to do the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. Is trying to budget for that. And, you know, a big part of that is having a language access plan, understanding, you know, your community, um, what types of languages you may encounter, where you may need to, you know, in advance have documents translated or ensure that you're contracting with an interpreting service. Um, you know, things like that, they have to be built into the budget. So my understanding is right now there is not a, um, there's not a federal pot of money uh, for language access okay. uh, right now. I know that at one point, and I'm not sure if this is still the case, states could apply for federal matching dollars if they chose to cover language services in their Medicaid program. I believe that still exists. I'm not sure what percentage mm -hmm. the federal government would cover. I'd have to look at that. Um, but right now in Maryland, we don't have a pot of money for providers to utilize. Um, I know that there are, we've heard of some counties that actually do set aside funds for um, mm -hmm. uh, for providers, I think behavioral health providers, to be able to access and apply for, for language services, but there's not like a, a pot that providers can um, dip into right now, or, you know, this service is not reimbursed in Maryland, which is a barrier. Yeah, um, I just, I just, I have fear on so many levels. Um, we passed the Healthy Babies Act last year, and we know that doctors are going to be required to take on Latina patients who may or may not speak English. <laughs> and there's already, because of the, the low rate of women, you know, Latinas, or the high, let me put it this way, the high higher rate of Latinas who don't access healthcare for a host of reasons. Um, it could be like a triple whammy for them. Yes. But also the doctors may try to avoid it. They try to avoid providing those services. Um, is what if that happens? How do we address that? So if that happens, um, so everyone has the you know you have the right to file a complaint um, with uh, the federal government. The process has been so how do I describe this? It's we don't Santhian. have a robust. Um, <laughs> I think that yeah, we don't have a robust process for addressing language access complaints. Um, our office at the Public Justice Center. We are always happy to represent individuals in addressing complaints that they have, um, either with providers or with state agencies. They would just mm -hmm. contact our intake line, and it would be me who would, you know, reach out to that provider to um, remind them of their obligations to provide language services and um, request that they be provided. So, if you do encounter situations like that, where you um, have someone that's trying to access services and the provider says we don't provide interpretation, please contact us. We're happy to help. The other avenue that people have is through the Department of Health and Human Services. You could file what's called an administrative complaint. Um, I will say that process has not been great because it takes so long for the federal government to resolve um, complaints. You know, when we we recently met with um, the Department of Health and Human Services, their Office of Civil Rights, and learned that it can take, depending on the type of complaint, it can take up to a year for them to investigate and resolve a complaint, which is a very long time when you're talking about time sensitive health needs. Um, and, you know, part of our recommendations is that we want to see Maryland have its own investigation and enforcement process, either through, you know, it can be through um, the Maryland Department of Health, it could be through um, either something like a language access ombudsman in the Attorney General's office, but something to help individuals address these. Um, these violations, you know, locally and uh, more uh, quickly. So that's what I would say is if someone encounters this problem, you can contact our office, we're happy to help. Um, but also, you know, each provider should have a complaint process. That said, I don't know if every provider has a complaint process around language access. Um, what we've typically seen is that you know, with providers who aren't following the law. I know there are great providers that are and are doing their best, um, but the ones who aren't, we have seen times where they've told people um, who've, you know, said, I want to talk to somebody who's higher up in the um, practice about this issue, and then told, sorry, we don't provide uh, interpretation and not given any sort of route to challenge that decision. 
Um, sorry, I'm having a cough attack. Um, we're okay. getting close to the end here. Um, we have two minutes left. Normally, I hand it over to Veronica to thank our guests, um, which I'm going to ask you to do because I'm about to start coughing again. Happy to do so while you have your attack. Um, <laughs> Dr. Pope, thank you so much. Ashley, thank you so much for this incredible information. Um, I, I want to remind folks of what MLU does because we have some new partners today. MLU, Maryland Latinos Unidos, was founded two years ago because of the disparities in, in access for Latinos during COVID. And we are under the umbrella or in partnership with Maryland Associations for Nonprofits. So the idea is we can immediately hit the ground running and activate on all of these gaps. So yes, it's very health focused. We have a huge grant that we received from the CDC that we've been executing on for two years for uh, vaccine access and equity, and we've moved it into Latino health equity, thanks to Gabriela and a lot of partner providers handling HIV, um, mental health. Um, so that's one piece of it, representation, education. There's a lot more work that MOU is doing. So I'm inviting all of you to stay connected and to speak up and to advocate. What has happened over the last 30, 40 years in Maryland is we're doers. So we just are resourceful and we fix our issue ourselves. We put a little bandaid on it. We'll bring the kid, we'll bring the neighbor to the doctor's appointment and we have them interpret. They don't know what the hell they're saying, but they're supposedly helping us. And everything we do is a bandaid. So our goal is to stop that. Our goal is to support one another, identify funding sources. MLU is not doing direct service. We would rather collaborate with Hopkins, with the Public Justice Center, with Central Store, with all you, for you to execute. You know the community, you're on the ground. So my plea today is, if you're not talking to us, if you're not a member of MLU, and it's not expensive, guys, we're not talking millions of dollars, so talk to us if that's an issue, but you and your organization need to be a member. You need to talk to us. What's happening, good and bad? What do you have going on that we can amplify and support? Because Gabriela is masterful with her connections and we're constantly getting resources. So should we get a grant focusing on mental health? We need to know you're trying something so we can have you activated. So my closing plea is that the work is great. Too big. Not great in a positive sense. It's just grand. And we just need to work together. And we have to stop fixing it ourselves. We have to stop pretending you can do it alone. You have to stop being band-aid, a band-aid. It's not sustainable. If you get divorced, married, moved, promoted, your project's gone. So our goal is that our little 12-year-old girls got back up until they're out. Our Great. goal is that when Sarah, you know, Sarah Polk moves on, we got backup. When Monica Guerrero moves on, we have backup. And it's permanently, sustainably <clears throat> address so let's just work together um Gabriela if you're not dying anymore I'm okay now okay, I think <laughs> till I start talking <laughs> so um thank you so so much to both of you um I am just so grateful to you for bringing this together and that report is phenomenal and um just lifting this up it's such a constant access to language is as a you know the lack of it is such a barrier to so much of the work that we're doing it doesn't matter the issue um but in the case of mental health this is a moment you never know it could be a crisis and so it can lead to spiral into so many other things so um uh thank you for being with us um plan on hearing us from us again um, as you were talking, both of you, I was like thinking, oh, we could do this or we could do that. Um, so without taking you too far afield, um, I'm sure there's lots of room for us to collaborate. Um, we believe in that. That's our motto. We convene, we, uh, we uh, converse, we cultivate, and we collaborate. And that's how we get things done because um, we can't do it alone, to Veronica's point. This is why we're here um, to help each other out. Thank you so much. Um, phenomenal. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that you're there. Uh, you're really doing us all a great favor. Um, service.
not a favor. You're doing us a service. <laughs> so uh, have a great day, everybody. Enjoy your weekends. It's Thursday. We're uh, we're almost to Friday. Um, and, um, and thank you, Monica, for bringing this up uh, as a critical issue that we should be talking about.